Heavenly Father, we bow our heads again because we are humbled by the opportunity that you have given us to look into the revelation of yourself in the word that you have spoken, the Bible that we preach this morning is inspired by you, breathed out by you. And it is powerful in its inspiration to change our lives. We know that it is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, and for training in righteousness so that we, people of God, might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so, Lord God, we ask that you would use your word in a powerful way this morning to shape your people. May you use it like a sword, a sharp two-edged sword that divides asunder even soul and spirit and joints and marrow and judges the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. And may you use it to shape us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, so that as we leave this place and live our lives in the week to come, that we might be driven by the truths of your word and the gospel that is preached this morning. May your word have the preeminence in our minds and our hearts, much more than mine. And may people not remember the, the speaker, but remember the words that they hear but not be mere hearers, but doers of the word for your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. There was, I've received many gifts in my life over the course of the time that I've been alive. Many of them have been fantastic gifts that I have loved but there is one gift that I received in my lifetime that has, that has a very special place in my heart. I, I think of it as my favorite gift, not in the sense that all the rest of them were bad, but this one just stands out to me from all the rest. I received it when I was a senior in college from an unexpected source. Krista and I had just started dating right around the time of my birthday, which is relatively close to Christmas as well. And I don't even actually remember why I got the gift. If it was for my birthday or for Christmas, I couldn't even tell you. But I got it from, her, from two of her sisters, from Abby and Lisa, her younger sisters. And, and what it was, was a keychain with, with a bear's helmet on it, a Chicago Bears helmet on it, which is really ridiculous, right? You're like, Pastor Rory, why is this your favorite gift? It, it was really cool, though. I mean, if you, if you hit it, it would talk and sing. It would say, touchdown, Bears, or it would play the little Bears fight song, which I thought was really cool. And, and I just, I thought it was so cool that it did that. I mean, this was the 90s, right? Technology was just starting to roll. You know, you take what you can get. But I think what really made it meaningful to me was the fact that was who it came from and the fact that it was unexpected and it was just, it was just a really thoughtful gift. I mean, these two high school, junior high girls buying a gift for this guy that's dating their sister that they hardly know. But they got me something that was like really cool to me. I mean, a bear's helmet. I mean, I was probably a bigger football fan then than I am now, and it meant a lot to me. It, but it was this gift that was given to me just purely of grace. It wasn't something that was, that was like I was expecting them to give. You know how you have those kind of gifts where it's like, well, I mean, we go to Christmas and we all exchange gifts, right? Like, we kind of expect it of each other. We expect it so much that we ask each other what we want in our gift. 
And, and it sort of minimizes the gift aspect of it. But in this case, it was this gift that was really a gift in, in the best sense of the word to me. And I, and I, I kept it for a lot of years. It, it got ruined. So I, I, I don't have it anymore. I, was actually, I actually looked for it. I thought I might still have it. I looked for it so I could bring it and show you. But I don't have it. But it was, it was a really precious gift to me. It's my favorite gift that I ever received, insignificant though it was. As I've, as I've alluded to, an, another word for a gift is grace. Grace, especially in Scripture, is God giving us something that we don't deserve, a gift. And Paul has been talking about God and his grace and his gift all through Ephesians so far. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. He's given us these spiritual gifts. Ephesians 1, 6, that, he, that we might be to the praise of his glorious grace which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. He gave it to us. Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace, the riches of his gifts. Ephesians 1, 11, in him we've also obtained an inheritance, having predestined, been, been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. This inheritance is a gift. It's not something we earn or deserve. Ephesians 1, 17, he talks about, he prays to God that he might give you, the Ephesians, a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. And Ephesians 1.22, he put all things in subjection under Christ, under his feet, and gave, gave him as head over all things to the church. God is just giving and giving and giving to people in Ephesians 1 and 2. And this grace becomes even more significant, I think, in Ephesians 2 because, of, because Paul emphasizes the character of the people who are receiving the gift. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. This was our destiny, wrath, the wrath of God. And this emphasizes, as verse 6 in Ephesians 2 does, that in the ages to come, God might show the surpassing riches of his gr grace in kindness toward us in Christ. When, re when we realize what we actually deserve, and we contrast that with what we've received, we recognize that we have received the riches of God's grace. And verses 8 through 10 is a further explanation of this reality for us as people. That's what the word for means that begins verses 8 through 10. It's an explanation. So what Paul is doing in verses 8 through 10 is emphasizing... God's grace in salvation by repeating the same idea four different ways. He's emphasizing that salvation is a gift from God. Look at what he says here. The first way he says it is, by grace we have been saved through faith. And then he says this, this salvation is not of ourselves. And then he says, this salvation is the gift of God. And then he says, this salvation is not a result of works. So Paul uses two synonymous positive statements, by grace we have been saved, and this salvation is a gift from God, and two synonymous negative statements, 
It is not of ourselves, and it is not a result of works, to emphasize the most important truth in all of Scripture, which is what this passage is emphasizing, that salvation and its results are the gracious gift of God. Salvation and its results are the gracious gift of God. And this coincides with what Paul has said in other places in the scriptures. In Romans chapter 3 and verses 23 and 24, he says, All have sinned, as everybody has sinned, and he's just gotten done proving that earlier in Romans 3. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 3, 23 through 24. And so we recognize that in the gospel of Jesus Christ, what we are seeing is, a, a, is the, the greatest gift that you could possibly imagine. It is much greater than a silly keychain that sings and talks. It is the gift to end all gifts given to people who deserve it very little. I correct myself, not very little, not at all. What we deserve is hell. We don't deserve a day of life at all. We are children of wrath, and that's the way we are born. Destined for hell because of our sin. Because of the fact that our sin is in us, it is our state, our disposition, and our actions that prove it. But God and his grace come into the picture and he saves us. It's a gift. And this demands a response. I think when we see the fact that we are given such a tremendous gift... that there is an appropriate way for us to respond to it. If Imagine receiving a gift. Imagine me receiving that gift from Christa's sisters all those years ago and taking it and saying, oh, that's nice, and throwing it away. Or throwing it on the ground and stomping on it. Like That would be the height of insult to take a gift that someone is giving and either ignore it or destroy it. But sometimes that's what we do with the gift of God, is it not? Rather than see this gift as driving a certain response from us, we just ignore it. We say, oh, that's nice, thank you. And we just kind of act like it's no big deal. But I think, that there, I think that there is an appropriate response to the grace of God, and I think Paul emphasizes that response even in this passage in which he's emphasizing grace and the gift of God. He emphasizes that for us there is a certain way that we ought to respond and there's two of them in particular, two appropriate responses to God's gracious gift of salvation that I'd like to quickly walk through in the time we have remaining. The first is faith. The first appropriate response to the gift of God's grace and the gracious gift of salvation that God has given us is faith. That's what he says in Ephesians 2, 8a. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Now we need to talk about what faith is. What is faith? Some people think that faith is a work. They try to define faith as a work because it's an action that you, believing is an action that you do. Faith and believing are synonymous in scripture. And so we look at faith as this work that we do. Others think that it's merely intellectual assent to something, that like, oh, I believe these facts are true, and that's faith. But, but faith in Scripture is much more than either of those things. Faith is certainly action or involves action, but it is not a work. It does work along with assenting to certain truths. We must assent to certain truths, but that isn't ultimately faith. Faith is something bigger than that, and 
There was a commentator that I read this week that, that I think said it very well. I don't often quote commentators, but I think I, I'm going to today because of the way that he said it, I think captures very well what faith is in, in connection especially with works in which it's contrasted here. Right? He, he says, for by grace you are, you are you saved through faith, and it's not of works. So faith and works are contrasted. So how do we understand what faith is? This is what he said. By grace and by faith are inseparable companions which together provi provide the antithesis to any suggestion of human merit. God's act of grace is the ground of salvation and faith is the means by which it becomes effective in a person's life. In Paul's thinking... Faith can never be viewed as meritorious work because in connection with justification, he always contrasts faith with the works of the law. You can read that in Galatians and Romans in particular and both in chapter 3. Faith involves the abandonment. So here's where his definition comes in. Faith involves the abandonment of any attempt to justify oneself and an openness to God which is willing to accept what he has done in Christ. So, so faith is this, I just want to clarify what he's saying there. It's an abandonment of our attempt to justify ourselves. We say, I'm not going to try to justify myself anymore. I'm not going to try to say that I'm good. I'm going to admit that I'm bad. And it's an openness to God which is willing to accept what he has done in Christ. He goes on. The same applies here in regard to salvation. Faith is a human activity, but a special kind of activity. A response which allows salvation to become operative, which receives what has been accomplished by God in Christ. And I think this is what the scriptures say. John chapter 1 and verse 12 says that as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe on his name. Do you see what John does there? He takes receive and believe and he welds them together in that verse. Those who receive Christ are those who believe Christ. They believe in his name. In other words, they have faith. So they are receiving what has already been accomplished by God in Christ. This is the work that Christ does on the cross that we are trusting. Not our own work, not our own merit. And we're certainly not trusting our own faith. But we are trusting the work that God has done in Christ Jesus. I've always compared faith to sitting in a chair. So I think that's, that's a good mental picture for us to imagine. As I come up to the chair, the chair is doing all of the necessary work to hold itself up even as I approach it. But, but faith in the chair, if you will, is sitting in the chair putting the fullness of my weight in it, receiving what the chair is already doing, sitting there, holding itself up. And so, this is how we have faith in Christ, by resting in him, by sitting in the proverbial chair, no longer trying to justify ourselves, but receiving what God has given us in Christ. But Paul doesn't just tell us what faith is here. In fact, he, I guess I have really gone into what faith is here. But I think in this text, we actually find out what faith isn't. And what it isn't is boasting. And, this, and, and again, what, what that commentator said was that faith involves the abandonment of any attempt to justify ourselves. This is never, faith never, never, never says, look at me, look how good I am. I mean, I'm sure better than all those other people who don't go to church on Sunday. I mean, I'm sure better than all those other people who don't obey the Bible. I mean, and think about our culture. Oh, man, I'm 
sure better than most of everybody else out there. I don't promote CRT. I don't abo abort babies. I don't murder. I'm not burning down buildings. I'm not doing whatever it is our culture's doing. And we say it and we look outside and we look at the news and you know what news becomes for us? Just a big way of for us to self-justify. I am so much better than everybody else. At least I'm not doing all that. Sorry, that is not faith. When you start thinking like that, you are denying the very faith that you claim to hold because you cannot boast when you have faith. You are receiving what God has done in Christ, not what you have done on your own. A person with faith never compares himself with others around him and says, I'm so much better than they are. And Christ gives us a perfect illustration of this in the Gospels when he tells this parable to people in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 17 is where it's recorded. And he actually gave it to people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. That's what the Bible says. This is why Jesus gave this parable. This is for all of us who are self-righteous. I, I, I say us because I know I am too. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And Jesus says this, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went to his house justified, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Here's the reality of things. The church in America is more like the Pharisee than the tax collector. We're more likely to brag about how good we are and how much better we are than the rest of our culture than we are to recognize that we are sinners who deserve hell just as much as everybody else out there. And what does that tell me? it tells me the church has no idea what grace is. We think we deserve it. We think we've got a Christmas list to God. God, what I want is out of hell. Here you go, God. I'll appreciate that for Christmas, thank you. You can just wrap it nicely for me. But that is not the way it is. Each and every one of us deserves to go to hell and it is but the, by the grace of God that we escape it. And it's time for us to get off of our high horse and look at our culture not with contempt but with compassion. Because that's how Jesus looked at our culture. He looks at our culture that way. He looked at his own culture that way. A culture that despised him. A culture that would eventually crucify him. And what does it say about Christ? What does he how does he describe himself even? By saying, I'm not going to break a bruised reed. I'm not going to snuff out a smoldering wick. But let all who are labor and, and all who are heavy burdened by sin and despair and destruction come to me and I will give them rest for their souls. Jesus was compassionate and we are contemptful and we, we hate our neighbors for their sin instead of feeling sorry for them because they're on their way to hell because we think we're better than them. That is not faith. That is boasting. And is the antithesis of what Paul is talking about in Romans 2, 8 through 10. But there's a second response. It's not only faith. The second response to the work of God in salvation is obedience. It's in verse 10. There's that word for again. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. 
This word translated his workmanship in the NASB is used twice in Scripture, once here and another in Romans 1 and verse 20. In Romans 1.20, it's talking about the creation of the world. God's work in creation. But here, it's speaking of something different because he says that we were, he says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So it's, it's talking about God's work of new creation that he starts in us. Think of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where he says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is the idea that Paul is alluding to in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. So here it's referring to that work of new creation. So Christ is the mediator of the original creation. For example, Colossians 1.16, all things were made by him and for him, and he holds all things together. But he's also the mediator of the new creation that is happening in us. This is the creation of a new humanity, a new race. We sang that song to the praise of his glorious grace, which alluded to this, that the church is this new people, this new humanity, a new race. We're going to talk about that for the next two weeks as we continue on in Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to see how what God is doing is he's actually doing in the church is making a whole new people of God, us, He's, he's putting us into a family, and he's making us brothers and sisters, and it is really cool to think about. But we'll save that for a couple of weeks from now. But this is what he's doing in the church. He's making a new creation, and we are a part of it as individuals, but ultimately it's this big new creation of the church that is this new people of God, this new, this new race of humanity that's made up of every tribe and tongue and and nation and language. And so we are his workmanship. We're created. We're the work of his hand, his new creation. And he says that, that he created us, that he created four good works. He says we were created in Christ Jesus for good works. This is the purpose and result of God's work of salvation. And we've, we've been emphasizing this all the way through Ephesians because that's what Paul emphasizes. Look back at Ephesians chapter 1 in verse 4 where he says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, why? What was the purpose? That we would be holy and blameless before him. What about Romans chapter 8? That God works, we, we love the fact that God worked that God is working all things together for those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. What is the purpose? In verse 29, he tells us that we would be conformed to the image of his son. You see, this is always the purpose and result of God's work of salvation is to transform sinners into Christ-likeness. This means that good works aren't the source of salvation. Paul just said they weren't in verses 8 and 9. But what are they? They are the result of salvation. Salvation is not by works, but it is for works. Romans 6, 1 emphasizes this as well, where Paul says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Paul is, in that passage in Romans 6, he's answering an objection where people say, Well, we can live however we want, right? We've got grace. God's just going to keep forgiving us. So we should live however we want, right? Paul says, God forbid, of course not. That's not what it's designed for. God doesn't save you so that you can go live like a, like a heathen, but so he can change you into the image of Jesus Christ. And faith is proven to be real by working that's what the scriptures tell us. If he, or James chapter 2 and verse 17, even so faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. And Galatians 5, 6, for in Jesus Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, anything but faith working through love. Faith works through love. It transforms us. It makes us something new. I, I can't be the same person that I was if I believe. This is, what it, this is the concept that's most point, made most pointedly in Paul's writing in Titus 3, 5, 4 through 8. 
where he says, when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. Does that sound familiar? Not of works, lest any man should boast, right? He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy statement, and concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently, so that, here's the purpose, here's the result, so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. You see how this works? God takes us and he says, I'm going to save you even though you're an awful person, you're horrible, you're a sinner, and you deserve to die and go to hell. He says, I'm going to save you anyway. And he's gonna, But it's not just to save you. It's not just to get you out of hell. It's to make you into something new, a new creation, so that you will be careful to engage in good works. So that, so that I can make a difference in this world through you. That's why the grace of God comes to us. That's why God saves us, to transform us and to transform the world through us. This is an incredible truth that God works in this way. And he goes on to say then in verse 10, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. How can works be said to exist before they're being done? So here is God preparing good works. They're prepared beforehand, but they're not even being done yet. So we're going to walk in them later. What God prepared prepared before the foundation of the world should be thought of as already existing in him. This is because God is eternal. It's always now with God. There's There's no time with him. So he doesn't do things like one before the other. He just does. It is. Every moment is now with God. So in eternity, God chose to save people. That's Ephesians 1, 3 through 5. And he outlined the way they should live, according to verse 10. Good work. So this is what the scriptures are telling us. He not only ordained the plan to save us, but the way we would walk when he did. Paul said as much in Ephesians 1, 4, as I referenced already, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. And one commentator writes it this way, the Spirit of God who produces all good works and attitudes does not take control over man in such a fashion that we are manipulated like puppets on strings, but he activates man and makes him a responsive partner of God's covenant. So when we receive the work that God's doing in Christ, he activates us and makes us a responsive partner to the work that he's doing But we might be tempted to say, well, God, since God prepared all this beforehand, I guess it's predetermined. I don't need to do anything then. Paul says just the opposite. Rather than promoting total determinism, Paul emphasizes that God prepared these works beforehand. Why? So that we would walk in them. We have a role in this. And this brings Paul's argument full circle. In verses 1 and 2, what does he say? We walked according to the lust of the flesh, according to the world, according to the devil. The world and the devil and the flesh controlled us. But the grace and mercy of God working in verses 2, 4 through following and following, what it transforms us so that now we're walking in good works. We were once walking according to the flesh, the devil, and the world, and now we're walking in good works. As one commentator says, God's saving power reaches its intended goal when there is a changed lifestyle. Only in the actual practice of good works is the contrast between then and now, death and life, completed. Such a thought has implicit imperatival force. Like we could come up with all kinds of imperatives then, like do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, live this way. But Paul doesn't do that right away. He he waits for the second half of the letter to give us the imperatives. We'll get there. And so we must respond to the gracious gift of God which saves us in both faith and obedience. And this is the emphasis of this text. God is calling us to believe and he's calling us to obey. Now just the mention of the word obedience can cause all of us to cringe just a little bit. I mean, it does for me. We're kind of like the three-year-old who was caught eating cookies and explained it this way. I just climbed up to smell them and my tooth got caught. We just can't seem to get it right, no matter how hard we try. And it's really easy to hear teaching like this, 
about obedience and living a certain way and for us to just beat ourselves up. We feel guilty and we feel defeated because I don't know about you, but like I just think back on the last week and like I can think of things like that weren't good. There were plenty of not good works in Rory Martin's life in the past week. But Paul is not going for guilt and despair here. In fact, the Bible never actually is going for guilt and despair, ironically, because we feel that way so often. That means that's, that's part of our problem, right? Now, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to do some sort of like as removing conviction from your heart. If, if you are wrong, you should be convicted but, we, but we're not supposed to just carry around guilt and defeat in our entire Christian life. That, that is not the point. Because as, even as Paul says what he says here, as he emphasizes that we are to walk in good works, he also emphasizes that we don't do this by ourselves. And we don't do it without an advocate. One theologian said this, and I think this is awesome. The distinctive thing about Christian or theological ethics is that we do not have to do any carrying without remembering that we are carried. Let me say that again. We do not have to do any carrying without remembering that we are carried. Isn't that great? This is the synergism of our transformation. Yes, we carry, but we carry while being carried. We walk in the path that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in, not that we just have to come up with our, on our own. And remember, this is God's grace that saves us. It is not our good works. When the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him, he is emphasizing that Jesus' righteousness is always, always enough for us. It's not only enough for us when we first believe. I think that's what we have as our mentality. It's like, well, I need Jesus' righteousness when I believe the gospel, and so then I'll move, you know, like, then I'll be good, right? I'm just good with God. But we forget that Jesus' righteousness is good all the way through our Christian life from beginning to end. It captures us. We come to Christ dead in our trespasses and sins, walking under the influence of the world, the flesh, and the devil. So we need a righteousness, not our own, to make us right before God. But we never move beyond needing that righteousness in our lives. We never move to a place where we can stand before God and say, Hey, God, look at me. I finally did it. I got there. I'm like Jesus. Some people have slanderously accused me of teaching works righteousness because I emphasize the biblical teaching that faith in Christ demands works. It is not as though once we become Christians, we cease needing God's grace in our lives and, or his strength. And I would never teach that you don't need Christ. It is all of grace. But we never outlive needing that righteousness of Christ either. And that means that when we fail, as we strive to walk in the good works that God prepared before him, we and we will fail again and again and again, that we fall back on the righteousness of Christ. And we remember, you know what? God did, Jesus did this perfectly for me. Jesus is the one who is my advocate before the Father. He is the one who makes me able to stand before God. And that is, it is only through his righteousness that motivates and enables any good works that are ever in me. If you ever see me do something right, you know what you should say? Not good job, Pastor Rory, but praise the grace of Jesus. Because that's what God's doing. It's a picture of his grace in me. Just remind yourself that you don't do the carrying without being carried. You don't do the walking without the works being prepared before him, and you don't have any righteousness of your own outside of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Jesus is enough. And when all we have is Christ, we have plenty to carry us through. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the grace that is ours in Christ Jesus. Thank you that we are saved by grace and it is your gift. Thank you that it is not of ourselves and not of works. Thank you that we 
can never boast in who we are or who you've made us to be. Lord God, make us to the praise of your glorious grace, not to the praise of our hard work and discipline. May every good work that is done in any member of Liberty Baptist Church always be to the praise of your glorious grace. And may we, as your people, always give praise to you for the grace that we see in each other's lives and in our own. Because we know that without Jesus, we are without hope in this world and we are still in our sins. And so we rejoice in you and the power of the gospel and the grace that is ours in Christ. And Lord God, I thank you that you have transformed me. You are working to transform me and that you have saved me by your grace. Thank you that all I have is Christ and he's all I need. In Jesus' name, amen.